welcome you to this service as you join us on Facebook and online. You are very important to the worship life here at Woodlawn, and we welcome you to this service as we continue our summer Sundays, and we are focusing on the book of Genesis and the story of Abraham's descendants now as we consider divine dysfunction. Our scripture comes today from Genesis, the 25th chapter, beginning with the 19th verse. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padaram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger." When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first tell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau the stew that he was eating and bread. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. The first sentence of Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, Anna Karenina, is this. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. That certainly might be the way that we would characterize this family. When we read the Holy Bible, maybe we don't normally expect stories about infertility, obstetrics, genealogy, legal wills, or family dysfunction. But we have it here this morning. You see, the story of Jacob and Esau is much like walking into a county courthouse and sifting through the musty boxes of birth certificates, death notices, marriage licenses, records of lawsuits, medical histories with family pathologies, and resentful letters that might not have been meant to be read by anyone. But that is the case for us today. You see, in the reality of who we are, in the midst of our own lives, all of us know at some level some form of dysfunction. That is why we are here today, because our lives are marked by brokenness and sin. And the story of your redemption and my redemption, of the redemption of all of humanity and of creation itself, is rooted in the fact that divine grace meets us in the very places that we are most dysfunctional. 
We have in this story, as I've shared it to you, Sarah and her daughter-in-law, Rebecca. We remember that they were both suffering from a form of infertility. We know that there are about 10% of those who are of the age of reproduction in this country who suffer some form of infertility. And by the way, that affects both men and women equally. Multiple births have become more rare. Twins occur in only 3% of the live births in our culture. Triplets occur in about 1.8 per 1,000 live births. And so we see in these statistical improbabilities the components of how God works. Now you see, whether in those days of Abraham or in our own days and age, infertility can be a tragedy for those who experience it. You don't expect good things to come out of such a situation. After all, to be barren in the days of Sarah and Rebekah was to be deemed irrelevant. Even today, infertility can place us in a situation in which we may feel that God's place in our lives is somehow not fully present. Others may even see it as a form of divine punishment. But those kinds of deductions as the scriptures would remind us today, are premature. You see, human loss and powerlessness are those places where we are most broken. And it is in those places we are most broken. Ernest Hemingway, the writer, said that we are most strong. But I remind you that strength is the joy of the Lord, as Nehemiah says, which is our strength. It may be very difficult for us to fathom how anyone can take joy. In the midst of this story that I have shared with you in which there are levels of loss, levels of dysfunction, the Genesis story about Abraham's extended family contains around 50 different persons. Almost every one of these persons in this story are male. Because you see, women in the day and age of Abraham did not count, and particularly so if they were barren. In the midst of this history that we reflect upon today, we No, there is loss. What if we were to draw a circle that reached out to our 50 closest relatives? What all would that encompass? Our stories would all contain not just the lovely moments in a Hallmark television special, but the reality of why we need God's saving work. Abraham, we know, fathered eight sons by three women. Now we know of Ishmael and his mother, the Egyptian slave Hagar. Then there's Isaac, who was born of Sarah. Then we read that after Sarah died this week, Abraham married Keturah, with whom he fathered six more sons. But those stories reach or reach a screeching halt. There are only two offspring of just those two of the six who were Abraham's grandchildren that become the focus of these scriptures. One of those two grandsons gives birth to three clans. Those are Abraham's great, great grandchildren. 
Surely there were daughters born amongst all of those. But there is no mention of them. Nor does the one who kept these records comment on any of the significance of why. We do reflect today upon these words in Genesis 25, 5. Everything that Isaac owned, he left to Isaac. Everything he owned, he left to Isaac. So, out of that reality, there is the brokenness that is the function of dysfunction. So that we see the grace of God manifest. Abraham obviously disinherited seven of his eight sons and their families and banished them. How could there ever be a better case of family resentment? We don't know very much about Ishmael either. The one son that was born to Abraham by the servant Hagar. We know that Ishmael fathered 12 sons. Any daughters are not mentioned. We read that Ishmael died, and then these scriptures say they lived in hostility toward their brothers. Abraham's disenfranchisement of his offspring resulted in bickering. And that is how Sarah and Hagar bickered themselves from the very beginning. Sibling rival. And we have the most excellent case of it in the story today of Jacob and Esau. The scriptures tell us that during Rebekah's pregnancy, the twins jostled each other within her as if they were feuding within her very womb. Now, that would have been a reversal of the wisdom of Abraham's day, but God announces that the older boy will serve the younger. From birth, the fraternal twins, we read, were different. Esau was born rough and ruddy, a hairy boy who grew up to be a rugged hunter who loved the open country, and Jacob was quiet, staying among the tents. We find him in the kitchen, cooking with the women. Aggravating these differences, we read that the parents played favorites. Isaac favors Esau. Rebecca dotes upon Jacob, resulting in Jacob conning his brother Esau out of the family birthright. His very name, Jacob, means Rabber. Under normal conditions, in the days of this story, that gave the one who was the bearer the double share of the family inheritance. If that were not enough, we read that Rebecca lies to Isaac so that she and Jacob could swindle the family blessing, and Jacob learns his lessons well too. For later in the book of Genesis, he too plays favorites, loving Rachel more than Leah. But we read in chapter 26, God bless Isaac. You see, God carries out his plans as he did in that day and age we read of. He carries out his plans for redemption through one of the twin boys, but not the other. Jacob, not Esau, becomes the father of the nation Israel. Through four women, 
the sisters, Rachel and Leah and their slaves, Bilhah and Zilpah. Jacob will father 12 sons to become the head of the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of them will come Christ. And what about Esau? Esau becomes the head of the rival Edom. There will be tragedy. There will be drama. But in the midst of all of this family history, there is the reality of God's desire for salvation for his people. There's no way for us to understand why God chose Isaac instead of Ishmael, or why one of Petra's six boys was not chosen, or Jacob chosen instead of Esau. There's no reason that we know very little about Petra's six boys or Ishmael's 12 sons. There is no explanation. But the work of God was in the midst of it. In the midst of all of these undeserving lives, so entirely flawed, entirely human, God's choice was not based on who deserved it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All of these persons in this story at some level or another have their issues. Oh, and that's why it is so amazing to me when I hear people speak of family values related to the Bible. None of them offer better metal for the history of why we must all be saved. We can take encouragement in that today. That through divinely blessed dysfunction, these people and their families look, feel, and sound very much like our own. Yet God works through them as he works through us today. Through all the improbabilities, through all the challenges of barrenness, through all the multiple births, yes, and even the dysfunctional behavior. In God's gracious hand, that that is accidental and ordinary becomes extraordinary. Both in these words that we read of Israel and of our own families today. Thus, we are here in the power of the Holy Spirit knowing that in the genealogy of Jesus, we see God and his solidarity, even with the fallen. Gospel of Matthew. 42 men are listed in Jesus' genealogy. Four women are listed, none of them of good repute. And in the midst of that reality, we know that God worked his ways. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. Thank God for divine dysfunction. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the people say, Amen.
Jordan 